thank you so much and thank you to the observatorium in Mufalab. Uh, UMSU for inviting me. Uh, <laughs> I'm really excited and I'm honored to be here and uh, I was really impressed by the activities that you guys have done and I would say like kudos to you and congratulations for inspiring the next generation to pursue this field that you know that somewhat remains still inaccessible but you guys are making sure that it is accessible to everyone. So thank you for that. And uh, I don't know, but I hope I'm getting this right. But hello, and uh, apa kabar? <laughs> um, so hi everyone. Um, I'll just share my screen so I can start my uh pr presentation. Or oh, more of a discussion, but yeah, presentation as well. Uh, I hope you guys enjoy. Um. Can you see my screen? I think okay, you can. clearly. Yeah, okay. Uh, so uh, today's topic is how to initiate and develop inclusive and engaging space education programs for children. So uh, it took me a while because this is kind of like my first like talk talk. So I was like, okay, how do I structure this? And so usually I follow the five WH questions, uh, which always guides me uh, in communicating anything. So let's move on to that. So to give you an outline of what we're going to do, or what I'm going to talk about today is when it comes to creating space education programs for children, I will explore these five questions of why, where, when, what, and how. So that because uh, there is no clear blueprint or there is no clear procedure to how you can create these education programs because it all depends on you as well, your passion, your creativity, your uh, talent that and your love for teaching the children that goes into creating these programs. So I will so that's why whatever I'm outlining over here is something that either I have learned or I'm going to like outline the procedure in the best possible manner. So um, we'll start with the first question. Yeah, uh, why? So uh, when it came to talking about this uh, uh, about this particular topic, I remember that a, that a week ago I was in Ahmedabad in Gujarat, and I was attending a conference over there. But I was staying with a family, and that family had a uh, let's say a ten or eleven year old son. And uh, he asked this very interesting question to me because he knew that I was into the, in the space sector and I was uh, more of a science person. So he felt kind of comfortable to ask me questions saying that when milk is kept on the gas and milk boils, it spills over. But when you're boiling water, why does it just bubble and, you know, not spill over like milk? And uh, when it when he when he asked me this question in front of his parents, his parents were like, what kind of a question are you asking? Like, of course, milk will spill over and water won't. And I was like, no, there, it's, it's a very good question. But then I said, OK, let's look up on Google and let's check what the explanation explanation is. And then we seen, OK, um, there is a water vapor that's trapped under the cream of milk. And that's what pushes the milk out of the out of the vessel. So that got me thinking like, you know, children ask these questions. Why, why, why this, why that? And the thing is, as adults or as young people, you know, it's it's understandable that parents will be like, you know, what are you asking? This is, this is completely, this is so obvious, you know? And uh, so then the child starts to think, oh, okay, then it's not necessary to ask the question why. And even Carl Sagan said that, uh, Carl Sagan, a famous American astronomer, uh, said that when children are in school, they ask these questions, okay, why is the grass green? Why is the sky blue? But when it comes to college, somehow they lose that curiosity. They lose uh, the ability to ask the question why. And that is why we need to do these space camps because uh, these space education programs for children. Why? Why? Because they keep asking the question, why and they keep that curiosity till they reach um till they become a teenager and, ad and an adult because um as an individual in the space industry it is important to ask these questions and if we don't give children the freedom and the safe space to do that they will 
suddenly lose interest and they will be like, you know, this is not for me or I'm not capable for it. So when it comes to why we do space camps, the first is obviously to prevent children from losing that curiosity, losing that spark within them. And second, it is important for us as adults to train the next generation to take our country or to take our region and uh, increase their skills, you know, increase, okay, let's say in the next 10 to 20 years, the space industry is going to like, it's going to be a billion dollar industry and they will need a lot of people to be a part of that industry to to work in that industry. So how do we prepare the children today to develop the skills and develop, okay, we have to learn this software or we have to, you know, use this particular way of thinking in order to prepare them, you know, for this future that is that is actually coming. And of course, it's already here, but also the one that is going to come with uh, increase in moon exploration and Mars exploration. So that is why we do it. So once you understand your motivation, now you go on to creating your space education programs. So when it comes to where, there are two options that are there for you. One is remote and one is in person. Now I have done both of these. Uh, I have tried both of these um, ways to uh, conduct space camps. So I have a little bit of um, knowledge of how different these two programs went, you know, when it came to teaching the children or creating the materials. So let's take a, a little deeper look at that. So when it, if you are trying to conduct a space camp online, okay, there are different platforms that are available to you. And of course, there is Zoom, Google Meet and WebEx. Now, I'll, I'll tell you, Zoom is something that is very effective. You can share your screen, you can create a whiteboard, you can create a poll, and there are lots of uh, tools that are there to interact with the children so that they don't doze off as you keep explaining. Because, uh, I mean, during COVID, you may know how hard it was to listen to your own university lectures and not dozing off while listening to them. So um, Zoom is something that you may have to pay to, uh, to have an extended time. So that is one drawback of Zoom. So if you're willing to, you know, put in a little extra money or uh, maybe some money that you're getting from the space camp into creating a Zoom account that is, uh, you know, available for unlimited amount of time for large amount of participants, then that is a good thing. Google Meet is what I used for my online uh, space camp. Uh, it was very effective. Uh, because it is free, <laughs> that is why it was very effective for me. Uh, but in addition to that, uh, the one drawback was obviously when I share my screen, I am not able to see the participants on my screen. So I had to like use a second device and check, okay, are those students listening? Are they dozing off? Are they, you know, distracted by anything around? So that was one struggle that I had. And WebEx is something that is, it's really cool. And uh, I think you should give it a try. It's mostly used for uh, for professionals, but uh, so it might be a little difficult to navigate around. But uh, once you get the hang of it, uh, it it, pro it pro proves to be a very useful tool. Now, when it comes to creating quizzes and, you know, like, okay, how do I interact with the children online, right? Because there is no face-to-face -face interaction. So when it comes to Google, obviously, there is the Jamboard, which I love to use because they have uh, Jamboard with little sticky notes and you can draw on it. So Jamboard is very useful. Slido is also something that uh, I haven't used, but my university professors have used when it comes to quiz, uh, creating quizzes, because in Slido, you can ask, you can have different types of quiz. So one is obviously a question answer type of way. The other is you put in a question and everyone types in their answer, but you don't know who's, oh, who's typing that answer so it's anonymous so if the children are scared to give an answer or something like that slido is a good you know your tool to do okay they'll not the slider will not show that okay you have written that particular answer so if the children are like oh i don't know if i should put it in the chat or give it that answer slido proves to be a very good tool and kahoot is something that is very so if you want something that's very fun and you know interactive i would say go for kahoot because kahoot is uh, kahoot the only thing for kahoot is uh, you you may require, uh, if, if the children are using a phone, you may require the app to use it. 
but uh, other than that kahoot is very fun there is mcq there's polls and there are little colorful pictures and everything so kahoot is is good so these are all free tools kahoot uh, there is uh, there are some features that require you to pay for them so but the basic ones also prove to be very useful for teaching the kids okay um now uh, if you're doing in person uh, there are lots of options that you have to, you know, which are accessible for children where you can hold your space camps uh, or your space education programs. So obviously there are schools, uh, community centers and local NGOs. Um, when it comes to uh, toolkits that you need when you are in person, uh, there are, I always, whenever I approach, uh, actually I did, one in-person space camp last year at my own school where I graduated from uh, and uh, when I went there I just told the principal I just need your smart board and I need a blackboard that's it and one room I don't need anything more than that to teach the kids because that is that that is enough actually so if you're thinking oh my god I need to do an in-person you know like uh, I need to arrange this and do that and do this and do that I would say schools are the best place to go because your venue your classroom setup is already there if you go to community centers or local NGOs you may have to arrange a few things yourself which can be a little tedious so schools come on the top then community centers because there will be some people who will help out and local NGOs as well now when it comes to which one is better I am not biased okay because I've tried out both the methods um, now, when it comes to um, doing stuff online, one good thing, a very good thing is that, one very good thing is that um, it is accessible. So anyone from anywhere can join in in your space camp, okay? You don't have to go to hunt for venues, you know, you don't have to take that extra effort, okay? How do I... How do I arrange this? How do I bring the kids in one place? So how, how how will the transportation work? How will the kids come from where they are? What if they are staying far away? So that tension is not there for you. So uh, that is one good thing. But when it comes to uh, disadvantages, I would say is that lack of concentration. Uh, example, I would say I take, take myself, you know, take all of us during COVID when, uh, or during online lectures. I mean, who doesn't get bored after like 20 minutes, you know, of just listening to someone on the screen. And, I, I, and I'm sure that any of you who are present over here also right now may like doze off after 20 minutes. <laughs> uh, so um, lack of, uh, there is lack of concentration. So you may have to like ask for feedback continuously. Okay, have you understood this? Have you understood that? Or, you know, ask them a question that gets them talking. You know, if you keep talking for like 20 to 30 minutes straight, you know, they will be like, okay, you know, I can do anything on screen. You know, this person is not going to come to my table and be like, okay, what are you doing? So um, that is there. I have, I have literally, so when I did an online space camp, I literally seen a child sleep in front of me. And I was like, I can't do anything at this moment. So I just started talking louder so that the child wakes up. Uh, but yeah, that is one uh, challenge that you'll have to overcome. And internet issues, of course, is always there with online stuff. So um, you may have to tell the students to make sure that they have good internet, uh, internet connection. Or maybe you can ask the schools to give their, if they can use their computer lab or something so that, you know, the students can attend from that particular lab because the internet will be good that side as well if they can't access it from their homes. Uh, when it comes to offline, uh, pros are obviously you are face-to-face, -face, you are engaging, you are talking, you're doing actions and all of that. So that That is the best advantage of uh, offline. But uh, when it comes to disadvantages, again, there are distractions. I mean, children will do a little gossip here and there, you know, at the corner of the classroom. And also you may have to ask for attention. And it may, now the thing is online, you don't need to buy materials, you know, worksheets or activity sheets or anything. Like, you know, if you want to get a telescope to show to the kids, you don't have to do that in online, but in offline, you may have to spend a little extra to, or you may have to sit down and see like, okay, I am spending so much on my materials. Uh, how much will that be there for me or for my organization after I've spent? So you may have to sit down and do that calculation so that 
it's not a con basically but it it is something that you may have to put extra effort in so yeah okay if you guys are following me just give me a thumbs up like a check okay <laughs> cool cool um yeah so now it come now we finished where now it comes to when now uh when do you hold a space camp or when do you hold a space education program? First, that depends on the time of the year and how long are you keeping the space camp for? I have kept both my space camps for five days. And so I'll just explain of the experience that I had with keeping a long space camp. And uh, yeah, I'll explain it as we go along. So when it comes to time of the year, you need to know, okay, uh, for us in the Indian education system, we have the summer break, which happens in May, and there's a small winter break that happens in December. So you may have to okay look at the academic calendar or ask the school, okay, when do the kids finish their exams, you know, when they are a little free. Now, uh, one thing is that, good thing is that you, you can hold space education programs in summer vacation because everybody's free, they are done with the academic year. Uh, and there are more kids that will be available. So that is one plus point as well. But the only thing is that I don't know about the weather in Indonesia or du uh, during the during the summertime or, or uh, during May. Uh, but at least over here, I, I held my summer camp for the kids during May, the offline summer camp in, in person. And uh, I had taken them for an outdoor activity. And afterwards, many, many of the parents complained to me saying that, you know, it's summer, like don't take the kids outside. It's, it's it's hot, they are sweating, they are, you know, growing tired. So I was like, oh, okay, okay. So so that is one drawback. If you're holding it in summer, make sure that the time that you're holding it is at a time when the sun is not very harsh on the kids. So that is one thing. And the other thing is that the kids could also be on vacation. So I made sure that when I held my space camp, but so uh, in India, we finish in April our academic year and till May the kids have to be here okay May is when their actual vacation starts so till May they are here so I took the advantage and I'm like okay I'm going to hold this in April after they're done with their exams you know so that I get more kids at least uh, about winter break winter break is a smaller break so you may have to rethink okay do I need to keep a long uh, five days space camp or a three days space camp so you may have to decide on that depending on the winter break. And winter break also, it's Christmas, New Year. A lot of festivals are happening. So there may be, you know, like a maybe or maybe not situation of the, of depending on the amount of children that are attending the, um, attending the space education program. So you may want to ask yourself, do I want to keep it for a very long time? Do I want to keep this camp for like a week? Or do I want to keep it for like two or three days? So you may have to decide on that. Now, when it comes to duration, um, <clears throat> obviously that depends on the batches that you have. So what I had done for um, my offline space camp, I made uh, three batches uh, and they were all different standards, but I made sure they were all in one day. So one, one day I used to have three batches, which went on for like five days. So, uh, it so the duration it all depends on you. How uh, which grade children are you taking? Are you taking second, third, second to seventh, first to seventh, uh, eighth, ninth, tenth? You know, it depends on that. It also depends on the topics that you're covering. Okay, so that goes hand in hand. Okay, what topics do I want to teach the kids? The uh, it's interdependent. So, okay, how long do I want to keep the camp for, and how many topics do I need? And also depends on the number of children that are enrolled. Okay, sometimes you may get like, uh, you may like, okay, uh, be like, oh, I do not expect so many children to turn up for this space camp. So I may have to like split this batch into half. So it all depends on that. And uh, when it comes to duration also, think about the hours that you're, uh, hours that you're spending teaching. That again, depends on the topics. Uh, and uh, the second thing is your lesson plan. So what I did was, in order to prevent the kids from dozing off, I made sure that uh, I taught for 20 minutes. I did an activity for 20 minutes and I kept a 10 minute break and I followed the cycle again. So I, I taught two topics in like 90 minutes. So it was 20, 20, 10 and again, 20, 20. So that, that way I made sure that, you know, okay, just because 
the 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 mind of a child is really intriguing sometimes they may get bored in 10 minutes sometimes they may get bored in 5 minutes but max to max it's 20 minutes so i made sure 20 minutes lesson 20 minutes activity 10 minute break you know the break is very important and then again 20 and 20 so that's how uh, i kept the children you know focused on whatever they were doing and i made sure also that anything after the break of course after having a good lunch you will want to go to sleep so i made sure that whatever they did after their little break when their tummies are full in order to prevent them from going to sleep i made sure that the topics were light enough and fun enough to keep them awake now the third question is what so uh, what do i keep in the space camp now there are three things that we can talk about topics activities and materials now uh, you don't have to get your mind jingled up by okay what are these arrows about uh it's just that uh when you are making your topics your activities depend on what you are teaching and then you move forward to the materials which also depends on the topic because you may have to do a demonstration and it also depends on the activity so in, i'll just break down this whole thing uh, properly uh but before i do that um Does anyone over here know about the types of learners that are there? Any any person would want to put that in the chat. Types of learners. A uh, type of learners like uh, visual and no yeah. more. Yes. No, okay. Yeah. Yes. I've heard so, before. <laughs> oh wait. Oh. One. Yeah. So, uh, the types of learners. Yeah, you need to keep in mind that. uh actually there are five sometimes maybe six but i break it down to four uh there is visual auditory reading and writing and uh, kinesthetic so visual are those that you know they can just look at matter on the projector on the blackboard and they can uh, learn and absorb quickly some just by listening some by reading and writing and the others are by doing a particular activity so what happens is Uh, when you when now this webinar that we are talking about is how to approach and how to make inclusive and diverse education programs so when it comes to diverse we need to keep the types of learners in mind now when we are uh, talking or teaching uh, visual and auditory learners uh, get their uh, get their part and sometimes they are taking down notes so the first three learners have successfully absorbed whatever they are being taught so you can say like that maybe not fully 100% but let's say 80 to 90% the students that are sitting that the, these three types of learners that are present absorb everything so what about the fourth one what about the kinesthetic one that is where the activities uh, come in you know so uh, before i do that so i skipped a few things uh, so when we talk about uh, three things so this topics activities materials so when it comes to topics again uh education programs diverse and inclusive so feel free to play around with the topics i would say there are lots of them there's astronomy for me personally i like planetary science because i'm a planetary science student so there's planetary science space exploration then there's astronautics astronautics in the sense the lives of astronauts um the life support system how they grow plants in space you know all those kinds of topics so uh this uh, these topics uh, that you choose all depends on you what you are interested in what would you like to teach about because uh, the thing is if you are talking about something that you don't have a lot of knowledge on it could prove to be um, what do you say sometimes wrong information can go you know across like unintentionally so make sure that you do proper research on your topics on whatever you want to teach the kids or maybe it is something that i teach planetary science because i i'm learning planetary science so i love teaching about it so in that way uh, make sure that whatever you are teaching you are a good learner as well um so yeah when it comes to topics always remember to teach something that you're good at teach something that you already have knowledge about then uh, so that's the one mistake that i did in uh, in my um uh, offline space camp was i so i took diverse topics so i was like solar system and then galaxies and black holes 
and then the mood and the the types of rockets and all of that uh when i took black holes and uh, especially black holes and galaxies i was caught i was literally surrounded by 7 to 8 year old kids asking me questions about black holes and i'm like i don't know what to answer them they're like where is the nearest black hole will the black hole gobble us up how, how big is the black hole and i'm like i don't know about black holes how do i answer them so it's so that's what happens you know like so <laughs> i was like okay i'm teaching about black holes now next time you need to read up something about black hole because they just surrounded me like you know like fully like they just surrounded with their shooting questions so make sure that whatever you are teaching you have good knowledge or good background in and um now when it comes to also inclusive and diverse learning remember that you need to familiarize yourself with the syllabus that they're teaching in school so that uh, you know that you are doing some now now if they're doing something in school and if they're learning something in the space camp that is sort of connected it will be easier for them you know it will not feel like the topic is very far out or far fetched or something that is not part of their life you know if it's something that they are already learning in school and you know maybe you want to give more information about it that would that topic would be something good like uh, suppose um i remember in the uh, third or fourth grade students in their science textbook they have the solar system chapter right and they have okay these are the planets these are the asteroids uh, comets but sometimes children don't understand okay asteroids and comets they all rocks asteroid meet so what i do on the first day is i i kind of tell them okay there are all there is this all jargon okay there's meteor meteorite meteoroid and then there's a asteroid there's a comet all of them are rocks you know what is what is the difference between them but since they've already learned about a little about comets and asteroids they have some idea and so they don't feel completely lost so keep that in mind as well okay uh so yeah now when it comes to activities like i said we need to make sure that we are reaching out to these diverse types of learners <clears throat> so when it comes to uh organizing activities or creating activities for children uh ensure that you are not going to like okay i am let's say a 20 21 year old and i have done calculus and i have done all these complex subjects so how do i ensure that whatever activities that i am giving to the kids is something that is of their level okay something that they feel is fun and light so uh, there are some ideas for creating activities like for the younger age groups make sure that they are doing something related to coloring and drawing because that is what also they are doing in school and that is one way in which they will learn quicker uh, like i uh, there is a particular uh, topic of constellations and uh, for the younger kids even the older kids i taught them okay this is this constellation this is that one this is a constellation this is a name but for the younger kids how do you teach them that so i did a like a connect the dots thing so i just put the stars and i told them okay just connect the dots and make sure you know and then they look at the shape and they're like oh this looks like a like a soldier or someone with a bow and arrow or someone like a pan and all so make sure that you do that match the following counting and solving um and for the older age groups um try so so sorry for the younger age groups make sure the activities are light and they are fun um and when it comes to the older age groups make sure that you are building up their reasoning skills because i have seen uh, i mean i i went to teach in an all girls school uh, i don't know if this is common among all teenagers or just girls but i have seen that whenever the teenagers okay the second graders just come and form a barricade around me and start throwing questions at me like daggers but when it comes to the the seventh grade and the eighth grade they come to me and they are like is is this what it is is this is this like this they are, they are not they are not confident of their own reasoning and so whenever you are creating space camps like this make sure that the activity that you are making something that builds up on their reasoning skills so in addition to uh, mcqs and other kinds of questions make sure that you are doing something that requires okay building stuff out of materials or problems that you know requires such certain kind of logic and teamwork because teamwork is very necessary because that's how the space sector works you know diverse amount of people coming together to probably make launch a rocket 
or send a satellite in space, you know, something that requires decision making, something that requires teamwork, you know, maybe like uh, mimicking, okay, uh, there's a team and one team can represent a company saying, I want to send this satellite to space and one team can represent the scientists. And then they can be sort of like a banter, you know, okay, we last, we have particular questions, okay. How big is your satellite? How heavy is your satellite? Where do you want your satellite to be long? What So, you know, it builds up on their teamwork and their logical and reasoning skills. So this is one example that I would like to give. So the same topic, but two different age groups. So this is how I approach the kids. When it came to teaching about the types of galaxies, um, spiral, elliptical, and all of that, pinwheel, um, for the older age groups, I just did like a match the following. I said, okay, this is because they know they are they are they are knowledge is there. Okay, this is the shape and this is the galaxy. But how do I teach it to the younger kids? You know what they like they have to yet learn about the different ellipse and uh, spin wheel and all of that. So I told the younger kids, okay, draw. Like I put the pictures on board and they drew their own version of you know okay this galaxy looks like an oval so like that's an elliptical. Then a spiral is with the arms out and irregular. They just did like a little scribble on the paper. So same topic. So that's one thing. If you're teaching the same topic to two age groups, make sure that you're reaching their level and not yours. Okay. So make sure that whatever level you're teaching is in a way that they can grasp like fast. Uh, rely on the, not the quantity, like how much they are learning, but on the quality. Okay. How much are they retaining? How much are they memorizing? So focus on that as well. <clears throat> so now that uh, now we come to the next uh, the third part of what okay so my topics activities and materials now you have to do all of this calculation beforehand okay I'm teaching so answer topics what materials do I need for demonstration and what materials do I need for my activities so for example um, I had done I had done with the torch. I had uh, I had uh, made someone stand in between and uh, I had done like this kind of shadowy thing and I sh demonstrated how the solar and lunar eclipse works. Then uh, before introducing, okay, this is how the telescope works. You know, if you, if you put a telescope in front of children, they'll be like, what is this complex heavy machinery that is there? So before teaching that, I made sure that I, uh, excuse me, I made sure that I took around a magnifying glass and I showed them, okay, this is how, you know, this is similar to how the telescope works, okay? So this is how light bends with the glass, how things look bigger. So think of the materials that you may need. And for uh, activities, I always rely on worksheets. For the younger kids, get crayons and pencils and all the glitter and stickers and everything uh, when it comes to activities because they love that. So uh, I, I actually heavily relied on stickers. So I'll be like, okay, if you want to match this to this, I give up, okay, picture of uh, the sticker of um, of a, let's say like a solar eclipse. So I gave them a sun, earth and moon sticker and then they rearranged it the way they wanted. They wanted to depending, okay, solar eclipse is how you place the sun and the earth and the moon. So that's how I did it. So make sure that you get as creative as possible. And I had made this small activity of paper plates, you know, as sundials. So I took like, you get a lot of these on YouTube as well. So uh, take a paper plate and like put like a stick or a straw and you can, you know, create a sundial for, for the kids. So these are just examples. But just like, a, like I said, there is no one way to creating an education program. But think about the materials you might need beforehand. So now that we know all the preparations that are required, let's see how we execute them. So... When we're teaching topics to children, how do we ensure that, you know, that they understand and that 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 uh, that concept remains in their head, you know? Because sometimes they just look and they're like, oh, gone, you know? So you have to make sure that, okay, ensure, okay, how do I, how, how, in, um, how can I get creative with this particular topic that I'm teaching? So these are the three lessons that I have personally learned and executed when I've done when I've carried out uh, space camps <laughs> first advice step into the mind of a child whenever you are uh, designing okay I need to explain a topic 
in uh, a so-and-so manner. Don't think about your perspective. Think about the child's perspective. Okay, if I'm teaching about solar eclipse to a eight-year-old, okay, I can't just say Umbra and Penumbra and like get all of those uh, complex concepts on the child. I need to make sure, okay, what does the child, what did I know? Okay, like this is how I teach, okay? What did I know at the age of eight, okay? I didn't know about stuff like Umbra and Penumbra, but I didn't know about torches. I didn't know about shadow. So uh, that's what is required. So when it comes to stepping to the mind of the child, be aware that there is a knowledge gap between you and the student. Okay, there can be. Uh, I mean, I'm not. I'm not saying that I'm very old, but uh, all I'm that I'm saying is that uh, just be aware. Okay, my level is this, and this is the school level. So ensure that uh, whatever you're teaching is something is at the child level and not yours. You have to, you have to become your child self when you're thinking of okay, how do I explain this particular topic. And in order to help you do that, I would say uh, read up on all the academic textbooks that uh, that is there in the school or maybe the textbooks that are there in the shop. And sometimes, at least uh, in my case, there are textbooks that are available online as well. So I make sure that I run through the topics and see, okay, this is the level of maths that they know. This is the level of science that they know. So... Okay, now I know that I need to come down from like complex calculus to like simple addition, subtraction uh, when designing their activities. Um, so yeah, that is one thing. Um, it also, in addition to um, reading, uh, knowing what their current knowledge is, it, it also gives you a clue on what level uh, you are supposed to... Um, the No, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. Uh, but the level that you're supposed to teach to the kids, uh, don't take textbooks as something that is uh, certain, like take it as a benchmark. Okay, this is the level I need to teach. Don't go above it, too above it. Hover over there, but don't go too above. Okay, if, if the child knows about, let's say, constellations, don't go and say, okay, these are mega constellations, super constellations, this is the universe, this is the galaxy. No, like hover around that topic. Uh, second thing, now when, and I always remember that any, anybody, whenever they tell about the business, uh, creating a business or a shop, they're like, it's all about location, location, location. Okay, but when it comes to teaching children, it's all about association, association, association. So I'll tell, uh, I'll explain how this goes. Okay, so this is a bit of an interactive part. Yeah. So if anybody can put in the chat, what what is it that they're looking at on the screen? You know, like what do each pictures? I'm just taking a look at the chat. <clears throat> What is what? Uh, what do these three pictures look like? You know, picture number one, two, and three. You can just put it down on the chat. Okay, please, the uh, participant can answer. Pardon? Sorry. <clears throat> okay. Uh, maybe this from chat box. Yeah, pick one. Looks uh. like an eye. Yeah. <laughs> what does the second one look like? Do you want to give it a try? Uh, the third one is like a cub, a little yeah, lion. Yeah, like, like yeah, Simba. It's like <laughs> and, a Simba, yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. And uh, the, yeah, the second one is a duck. Oh, it looks like a rabbit. Okay, that's that's a new perspective. <laughs> uh, we have to like, yeah, turn my head here and there. But actually, yeah, if you flip it. <laughs> for most people, it looks like a cub. So... What I'm talking about association is this. Um, you when uh, I'll give the example of why I showed these three pictures and I'm talking about association. Now, when it came to teaching about constellations to second and third graders, now first of all, I live in a city where there's hard there's so much of pollution that you can hardly look up at the sky and see stars or constellations and recognize them. There are just few times a year where that can happen. So children don't know okay what don't know in real life what constellations are it either exists on the books so how do i introduce this topic to a bunch of second and third graders who don't uh from scratch you know who don't know about this at all 
so this is uh, how i taught them so i said first okay you know can you look at these pictures and tell me what you see and you say that you see an eye but it's actually a staircase right you say that you see a duck but it's probably a pumpkin i guess i don't know what a vegetable i'm looking at uh, but uh, and then you see a uh, a cub but it's actually a cloud so i told them that so when people who are very bored in the ancient days looked up at the sky they seen that a group of stars look something that is familiar to their surrounding so that's how i introduced the topic i said okay see how you recognize that certain subjects look like certain objects look like something that they are not in the same way when they looked up at the sky they said oh this looks like this particular shape that looks like a like a soldier that looks like a pan that looks like a bear so that's how i introduced so associate like relate your topic to something that is uh present in the child's knowledge base but also present in the child's surrounding in the child's memory now if i talk about a bunch of stars it looks like a bear but it actually doesn't right it's it's like a even i don't understand how they thought it was a bear first of all but if i'm telling that that group of stars is a bear they won't they won't understand it in the first place it'll be like that that that, that does not look like the or some age or some minor so first i just gave them a ground base saying okay some objects in life you know when you just take a closer look at them they look like something that's related to you so that's when i talk about association 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 so in that way you know the lesson becomes a little more relatable you know um something that is part of my life part of the child's life you know if you make it something that's totally separate from their life then they will not they will they will not memorize it they will they will just take it in and then they'll forget it the next day so make sure that you relate whatever you're talking to something that's already present in their surroundings <clears throat> and third is make it fun okay uh, that that is the one tagline that i kept is make your space camps fun and that is one lesson that i learned so i remember when i kept my space camp last year in may for for the school children uh at least for the second and third graders my uh they they started dozing off as i started teaching uh, the, this as normal as always um so what i did what my friend suggested to me was you know why don't you have like a small like a action song or something before you begin so before every day like just for 5 or 10 minutes i used to call them okay there was like there was actually an area in the classroom that was free of all benches so i used to call them to that area and then i used to put music on the smart board and then they used to like just you know and they used to follow my steps you know like put your left hand in your right hand out so it's something fun you know they start their class with something fun and since they are and by the end of that 5 10 minutes of physical activity they are like just tired like anything so they will want to sit down they will not be distracted so it so so the ball is in my court when i start teaching you know like okay i have the advantage now they will not be distracted they will not um, look left and right cuz they are tired first of all out of dancing but they also have fun you know and it, and uh, somewhat um, when you are doing such physical activities with the kids when they're doing something fun they tend to remember it better so i remember i even made a song remembering the planets of the solar system so for the younger kids include song dance uh skits and all of that so make it as fun as possible because school sometimes is very heavy school sometimes is i mean we've all gone through school so sometimes it it, it just it it gets you so you have to make sure that your education program does not remind them of school but is something completely unique and different and how you can make that is by adding a more fun element because you have that freedom when you're creating such things you have that freedom with you uh yeah so these are a few uh, resources that uh, i used for my space camp the links are uh, i i can put them in the chat as well a bit later or maybe if if they are sending an email out i can just forward it to you um one is there is this this is an amazing website okay it's called stem lessons for educators by nasa jpl and they have a full like uh, i would say full collection of activities like when you say you want to approach kinesthetic learners there there is a full range of activities and it's all you can just you know it's like uh, it's like amazon basically so there are just these activities 
and then there is a filter saying that okay for which grades do you want for which topics and it filters out and it shows you the activity now this i would i uh, i haven't done the activities that are present on the screen but i did take some inspiration from the activity shown here and this is this is actually very helpful if you are finding it a little difficult uh, creating activities for the kids so you can look up uh, you, uh, the only thing is that you have to ensure that these resources are available in your surroundings and that you have the enough funding to because some some of these activities require like like making a cardboard rover requires some amount of cardboard and like some some heavy uh, complex stuff so ensure that um, you have the resources and that you have enough funds to get those resources uh, for those children and uh, it's it's a very fun uh, thing and um, it is not only limited to sorry i forgot to say it's not only limited to offline but if you're doing it online there are some games also that are included in the list that can be done online so in make sure to look up for these resources the second one since i'm a planetary science student obviously i will come to this is this is a planetary geology uh, handbook that is made for uh, educators and teachers so if you want to talk about geological features on mars or uh, the wind patterns on like coriolis effect on jupiter so this is a very it's a full pdf i don't know how many pages but it's a lot and uh, it has tons of uh, pages filled with activities that can be done easily on pen and paper at least they've even given the um, maps and images for the same and the third one um is something that i love it's uh it's of uh, so nasa has this thing called pi day challenge so i think it's on the 14th of march is what uh, pi day is because 3.14 um so uh nasa has this nasa jpl has this website where they list down math problems that require pi but they are related to space so like the first problem that you see here on the screen is related to getting a core sample from the uh, from from the martian subsurface and it's like cal using pi you calculate the the volume of the core because you know it's a cylinder so you calculate the volume of the amount of rock that you've extracted from the from the ground so it, it's very fun it's it's uh, you may have to like uh, double cross and say okay is this the level of math that my kids are learning right now or maybe you yourself can you know filter it out and make sure that you don't add uh, room or the complex uh, complex uh, elements that are present in the problem but but it's it's uh, it's amazing they have one for every year so and i think they have like 8 to 10 problems uh 8 to 10 math problems so i would say go for it like if you want to involve math in what you're teaching this this is a great source um and uh, now as i like kind of ending the whole uh, webinar I mean, not webinar, sorry, ending my talk. Um, uh, these are the four L's. I'm saying the four lessons that I want to tell you all uh, or tell you if you are um, planning to organize a space education program. These are the four important things that you need to keep in mind. The Because uh, in addition to creating your syllabus, your lesson plan, your topics, um, it is important uh, that these four L's are executed in your program because it's not just about the materials and the topics, but it also depends on these. So the first one is listen. So when you're teaching to the kids, listen to, uh, it's not just about one way, listen to what they are saying as well, what they are understanding. Because sometimes you may say one thing and uh, they will understand something else. So make sure that um, every time you ask them for feedback, if they come to you for doubts, do not um, do not uh, push them away because uh, you are a safe space for them. You are the person they will go to asking for questions. And if you do not know the answer, uh, and uh, that comes to my second part, if you do not know the answer, learn to say, I don't know. I will look it up and I will get back to you. Okay, sometimes what happens is we 
try to prove you know it feels like we have to prove that you know oh, the children are trusting us with the answers so we should be having it no we are also learners we are still learning i'm still learning the children ask me questions that i don't know i think like some phd level research question or something so i'm like okay i will get back to you but have that in you to say i don't know do not give them half baked answers learn to say okay i do not know the answer to your question i'll either get back to you or we can sit after the after the class and we can you know work this whole situation out the third one is let go okay you are organizing this whole array of okay i need to get the children i need to get the teacher the educators i need to get the materials i need to get the activities it's, it's all a lot and sometimes things will not go your way my example okay uh, sometimes things will not go your way so make sure learn to let go learn to navigate through some challenges that will come okay sometimes kids will not show up and then they will come the next day and then the parent will tell you can you teach my kid what you taught yesterday uh, so yeah it 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 happens okay so uh, you it will sometimes will be first like you will approach some problems for the first time so make sure that whatever you are approaching don't fight against it be calm and learn to let go of um, you know whatever you're trying to control because one thing or the other will go haywire so just learn to like go with the flow basically and the fourth l is lead okay when you are teaching the younger generation you are not just teaching them you are shaping young minds to uh, and their perspective of the world so make sure that you're leading them with responsibility you know feed in them uh, uh don't mislead them with your perspective or with your uh the way you look at your life or the way you look at things okay help them to learn to be open okay help them to learn to be kind to to be helpful to work in team okay that that is the responsibility you have ensure that this is not something that is i say something and the kids will it's not just about facts it's about shaping them into the kind of person they need to be when they are growing up and facing the world so those are the four four l's okay listen learn let go and lead and uh, i don't know if i have anything else to add um uh, but yeah uh wait okay so with that i would like to say thank you uh for listening to my 60 minutes of talk if you have stayed awake the entire time i would say kudos to you you deserve that certificate that you are getting uh, if you haven't also totally understandable it's a lesson for you to know how the kids feel when you are teaching so uh, feel free to connect with me uh, via email i'm very active i mean i'm active on instagram and i'm also active on linkedin my name is namishka mendonsa you can see it in my uh, zoom screen so i hope you enjoyed and learned uh, whatever it is uh, this is this is my uh, words of pieces of advice and words of wisdom you might say so thank you all and uh, this is captain nemo signing off